Welcome to the Science Podcast for March 15th, 2019. I'm Sarah Crespi. In this week's show, I talk with staff writer Daniel Clary about the many, many theories surrounding fast radio bursts. These are extremely fast, intense radio signals from outside our galaxy. And a new telescope that's coming online that might help sort out some of these ideas. And I talk with staff writer Jennifer Cousin Frankel about her story on the long-term effects of pediatric cancer treatment. The survival rate for some pediatric cancers is as high as 90%, but many of the survivors have a host of health problems. Now we have Daniel Clary, a staff writer for Science, and he's going to talk to us about a feature he wrote on fast radio bursts. Hi, Dan. Hi. All right, so they're fast and they're made of radio waves. What else do we know about them? <laughs> well, very little, actually. Um, only about 65 of them have ever been seen, as far as we know. Though there may mm-hmm. be an announcement soon. These were just sort of discovered by accident, and they're very, very short. You know, they last a few thousandths of a second. And they're quite bright, and people just thought they were some sort of error in their detectors at first because they couldn't figure out what they were. Looking closely at the um, bursts themselves, they soon figured out that they were not coming from somewhere in our galaxy. So they were coming from deep, deep space. And so they must be coming from something really, really bright. Some sort of significant event was generating these things, but so far we don't know what. We have the signal. What does it mean? Yeah, exactly. So there haven't been many detected, but the ones that show up over and over again, the repeaters are the ones makes us think this is not an error in the data. This is something else going on. Yeah, that's right. For a long time, there was just one that seemed to repeat. All the others were single events and they never saw anything else coming from the same spot on the sky. But one of them repeated again and again. And I think there's been dozens or maybe even a 100 flashes from that particular spot. But it was the only one until uh, January this year when a second one was discovered. Is that a result of this new scope that's coming online, this one called CHIME? Yes, that's right. The second repeater was one of the first discoveries made by CHIME, which is stands for the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, which is in British Columbia in Canada and is still in its commissioning phase. So it's just starting to collect data. This is not a big circular dish, which maybe some people are picturing. Yeah, it's an unusual shape. It's four troughs that are about uh, 100 meters long and 40 meters wide. They don't move. They just look up at the sky and they have lots and lots of antennae at the focus of each trough going along on a gantry above them. Essentially, it just looks at a strip of the sky from one horizon to the other horizon. And it scans the sky because the Earth moves, the Earth rotates. So over 24 hours, it scans all the way around the northern uh, sky and does a complete survey. It's very sensitive and got a wide field of view. And so it's great for a survey looking for things that don't happen very often. I noticed that the acronym CHIME (laughs) doesn't have anything to do with fast radio bursts. So is it looking for both things? Is it looking at hydrogen and also looking for fast radio bursts? It's uh, looking for several things, but when it was originally proposed, it wasn't anything to do with radio bursts. People weren't even looking for them back then. This was, you know, about a dozen years ago, and they thought of building this telescope to map out neutral hydrogen clouds across the universe. If you look at their distribution, you can see ripples from uh, soon after the Big Bang. And if you map out how those ripples have moved over the whole history of the universe, it might tell you something about how fast the universe is expanding and whether it's accelerating and whether that acceleration has been constant. And that'll tell you something about dark energy, which is this mysterious force that people think is accelerating the um, expansion of the universe. At the same time, while it's doing that mapping task, you can also, anytime a fast radio burst is in the view, it can be captured by the same instrument. Exactly. Yeah. They just are looking at the same data, but just looking at it in different ways. Well, getting back to the fast radio bursts, you mentioned they're fast and they're made of radio waves. They're very bright. They're probably not in our galaxy. 
and some of them are repeaters. What are some of the theories for a source of this signal? What are some of the ideas that people have about what could be sending this out? Well, when people first started discovering them, and they seemed to be lone events, people thought they were some sort of cataclysm, you know, something that just happened once, like Mm -hmm. a neutron star collapsing into a black hole or two neutron stars colliding with each other. But um, once they discovered one that repeated, they had to come up with some other ideas. And there are many still dozens of different theories that are competing for attention because we don't even know whether the single ones and the repeaters are coming from the same sort of source. They could be coming from different things. So there are a lot of things out there, but a lot of them center around neutron stars because they know it has to be something very compact because it's so fast. You can't have a very large object produce a very fast signal because they can't, within the object, they can't send signals from one side to the other fast enough to act as one uh, all at once. So it must be something very small, about the size of a city is what they think. It's likely to be something very dense, like a black hole or a neutron star. And they know it's very distant. One of the main candidates are these things called magnetars, which are a neutron star that is very, very highly magnetic. And that energy in the magnetic field causes it to send out blasts of uh, material that will generate a radio pulse when it hits other gas clouds nearby. So how would we confirm that it was that? A magnetar. One of the ways people are trying to do that is by narrowing down where the fast radio bursts are coming from. Now, usually they're so fast that telescopes don't have time to focus in on where exactly in the sky they come from. But the repeater was different because that meant people could focus numerous telescopes on the same patch and wait for it to flash again. And then by combining signals from numerous telescopes, you can identify where it came from. And so the repeater that was discovered uh, a while ago was narrowed down to a dwarf galaxy. I can't remember how many billions of (laughs) miles away, but a long, long way away. But a dwarf galaxy, which seemed like an unusual type of location because it's not where you would typically think a neutron star would reside. But uh, dwarf galaxies do sometimes produce these things called superluminous supernovae. So that's a supernova that's extra, extra bright. And people don't really know what causes them, but perhaps there's some link between these super bright supernovae and fast radio bursts. Wow. So these fast radio bursts are like the weirdest things in the universe just pinging us and saying, why don't you look over here and see what you can find? Absolutely. Yeah, they're just entirely odd. And, you know, it's just getting theorists and observers in a complete muddle, you know, because they just can't figure out uh, what might be causing them. We're going to narrow the theories down probably in the next bit of time as more and more of these signals are read. What what does Chime expect to see? I mean, how many signals are they expecting to see when they're actually up and running? Because there are so few, it's hard to estimate what the rate is going to be. But their estimates ranged from one or two a day to maybe two dozen a day. And since we only know of 65 of the past dozen years of observing, that's going to be a huge increase in numbers if it can achieve that. We're waiting to hear what exactly they are finding. They're preparing some papers at the moment. So hopefully soon we'll see what sort of bounty they're getting. All right. Do you have your favorite theory of these 48 or so that people have proposed for the source of these? Well, the the sort of fun outlier is um, that they're created by cosmic strings. So these (laughs) are are sort of remnants. They're almost like a crease in the fabric of uh, space that some people think were created very, very early in the universe when it was expanding so fast that uh, space couldn't really cope. And you ended up with these fault lines that are still around today. 
again, nobody's seen one, but they think they could be there. If you got a kink or a twist in one of these, it could produce something like a fast radio burst. So oh, wow. that's one of those uh, theories that's still out there. And, you know, the other obvious one is that some people think they could be extraterrestrial intelligences trying to send us a signal in some way. But one argument against that is that they're coming from all different directions across the sky. So there would have to be a lot of different aliens trying to send the signals by the same method. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Dan. Okay. Daniel Clary is a staff writer for Science. You can find a link to his fast radio burst story and a glorious related graphic at sciencemag.org slash podcasts. Stay tuned for my interview with Jennifer Cousin Frankel on the long-term effects of pediatric cancer treatment. Now we have Jennifer Cousin Frankel. She's here to talk about a feature she wrote as part of a special issue this week on pediatric cancer. The focus of her article is on the long-term effects of receiving treatment for cancer as a child. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. What made you decide to write about this particular topic for this special issue? Well, I've written um, a lot over the years about childhood cancer, and I've always been well aware that while the cure rate for childhood cancer has has increased over the years, and it's really one of the big successes in cancer generally, there are a lot of after effects of these treatments. We're mainly talking about chemotherapy and radiation for children, and that those complications can persist for years. They can start many years later. And it's a really difficult problem. I actually wasn't sure if there was really a story here to write because my sense had always been that, of course, we have to treat these children for their disease and the treatments are toxic. And what are we going to do about it? So I started to look into that and found that there actually was a really interesting story here to tell. There's now a population, a sizable population of survivors of childhood cancers, 500,000, I think I saw in the story. And that means that you can start to really look at what treatments are doing what over this long time period. Yes, I should say it's less than 500,000, but it's it's over 400,000. So it's it keeps increasing with time because more and more children are becoming long-term survivors and, you know, should get to 500,000 before too long. What are some of the health effects that are being seen in the kids that live through cancer? There are a lot of them, and they're also really variable because, of course, different kids are diagnosed with different types of cancer. They need different treatments. They're treated at different ages. And so all of those lead to different health effects and also to a range. Some kids may not have that many health effects, and other kids may have a lot. And I would say... Some of the big ones can include cardiac dysfunction, heart problems, either starting soon after treatment or many years later. There can be infertility. There can be thyroid dysfunction. There can be a second cancer that's caused by treatment for the first cancer. There can be metabolic problems. There can be neurologic problems, particularly for children treated for brain cancer who got radiation therapy to the brain. That can cause a range of challenges down the line. So it's really very in terms of the types of health effects and their intensity. I think most of us know that cancer therapy can be damaging to the body, but what are some of the reasons that it's particularly dangerous for kids? Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. So one of them is just that kids have a longer time to live. So if you're treating a a 65-year-old for cancer and they develop health effects when they're, say, 80, that may not be viewed as the same kind of tragedy as a child who's treated when they're three years old and then develops health effects at 18, and they still have a long way to go to live their life. That's one reason. Another is that children's bodies are different than adult bodies. And on the one hand, they can sometimes withstand higher doses of certain treatments, but at the same time, researchers have found that in some ways their bodies are more vulnerable to certain treatments because they are growing and their tissues are growing, particularly in younger children, and they may be uh, more significantly impacted. Their healthy tissues may be more significantly impacted by the treatment that's, you know, of course, also killing cancer cells. Now that there is a sizable patient population, what kinds of investigations are being done to figure out how to remedy some of this, how to keep kids healthy a long time after they've had cancer? 
So that's one thing that was really exciting to me about this story. And I didn't really know going in how much people were studying this. But I think because there are now so many survivors and so many doctors have cured kids of cancer only to see them then develop health problems and in some cases die from the after effects of treatment. And that's that's really tragic. So there are actually a lot of efforts to try and work with survivors and study them and understand what's going on. One of the biggest and the oldest is called the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, and that was started in 1994 to really recruit as many survivors of childhood cancer as possible. And um, it now includes more than 25,000 survivors who were diagnosed all the way back in 1970 until the very late 1990s across the U.S. and Canada. And it also includes a number of siblings who serve as sort of healthy controls so we can really compare the effects of treatment versus no treatment. And so that project has has done a tremendous amount in you know examining all sorts of different health effects in survivors and genetics and just so many different pieces but then there are other you know narrower efforts or smaller efforts to look at smaller cohorts of survivors or to really focus on one component of the health problems that they might have right one you talk about in your story is looking at the genetic background of different patients and seeing how vulnerable they'll be to particular treatments can you talk a little bit about that yeah so one of the things that I think doctors have noticed for a while is that they can have two kids who have the same form of cancer, they get pretty much the same treatment, and then they have very different reactions to that treatment long term. And and so I spoke with one pediatric cardiologist who's done a lot of work with children who later develop heart problems, and he's seen some kids who 30 years later are doing just fine in terms of their heart. And then he's seen other patients who 30 years later have needed a heart transplant or some of them have died from the cardiac toxicity of treatment. And so, you know, really what's going on there? Something is separating these different kids from each other. And of course, one of the answers that people gravitate to is genetics. There's something different about their genetics that may make some kids especially vulnerable to the toxic effects of treatment. And it could be a particular toxic effect. It could be, you know, you're vulnerable just to the cardiac effects of a certain class of chemotherapy or just to the effects on, say, your hearing, because a lot of kids do do develop hearing loss from treatment as well. So we're talking about really narrow effects, not like an overall vulnerability. But that's something that people are really interested in, because if we can identify the kids who are really at risk, we may be able to tailor treatment or find ways to somehow give those kids extra protection so that years later they don't suffer a lot of complications. Yeah. One other thing I think we should touch on is this advanced aging that you discuss in your story. Can you talk about some of the symptoms of that and and what are some of the mechanisms that are suspected for causing it? Yeah, so that was some some research that I really found um, interesting and unexpected in the course of this this reporting for the story. And we should clarify, you know, again, we're talking about a subset of kids, a minority of kids. There was a researcher I spoke with who works at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. She started working there a little over 10 years ago, and she really wanted to meet a lot of long-term survivors to try and understand what was going on. And so she set up a sort of lab to kind of study how they were doing health-wise, basically. And they started to visit this lab. And she was really taken aback because, as she said to me, you know, they looked like old people. The way they walked, the way they sort of carried themselves, their muscle strength, there were a lot of details that just made her think of people who were, you know, many decades older than these survivors were. So she and some others are now investigating that and they are finding that a subset of kids do seem to experience a sort of accelerated aging, most likely due to treatment. And we don't know exactly what's going on there, but the thinking is that, you know, of course, chemotherapy and radiation are designed to kill cancer cells, but we know that they also damage and kill many healthy cells as well. And one theory is that when cells are damaged, they can kind of enter this sort of cellular old age way of being as a way to protect themselves and expend less energy. And it's possible that those sort of cells that become aged, thanks to cancer treatment, are then communicating with other cells around them and telling them to age as well. And then they emit different factors that can cause some symptoms of accelerated aging. But this is all still pretty early, and it's something that researchers are are actively studying to try and understand 
what's happening and you know ultimately how to how to prevent it in the kids who might be affected okay this really you know you've pointed this out in your story and i think as we've been talking this really seems like a tough thing to do even if you do discover that a child is at high risk for injury later in life what is a cancer doctor to do what are the parents to do how can this kind of decision be made? How, how are people dealing with that? Yeah. So again, you know, we're really at the beginning of this, but it is coming up. It's starting to come up. And one example um, that was shared with me was the story of a little boy um, named Asen who lives in British Columbia in Canada. And when he was just over a year old, he was diagnosed with a, a very high risk cancer called high risk neuroblastoma. And he needed a lot of treatment for that cancer. The treatment he needed included radiation. And because of where the tumor was, was sort of in his chest cavity, that radiation was going to hit his heart and, you know, could damage his heart. And he also needed many doses of a particular chemotherapy, class of chemotherapies that are known to potentially cause heart damage in kids. The doctors knew that, but they had to treat this child. But then this child was offered genetic testing, which was, which was at that point going on or is going on in a research setting through that hospital. And the genetic testing found that he was at extremely, extremely high risk of basically a very severe heart damage from treatment, about almost 90% chance of severe heart damage, according to the genetic testing. And then getting radiation on top of that would make that risk even higher. And so the doctors were really very worried about what would happen to this child. And his parents were worried too. And his parents felt like, you know, look, we can accept a lot of the side effects of cancer treatment, but this is one that really feels much less acceptable to us. Ultimately, after casting around and trying to find another protocol, you know, another treatment protocol for a child like this, there was one that was found out of Europe that used just one dose of the really heart hazardous chemotherapy. And in the end, actually in consultation with an ethicist and of course the family, the doctors left out that one dose. So this was the first time that this particular pediatric oncologist had treated a patient like this who had high-risk neuroblastoma without this class of chemotherapies. But they did it. It was scary, of course, even though he got a lot of other treatment too. But now this child is in kindergarten. He's almost six years old. He's doing great, does not you know, have any cancer, and also does not have any heart damage. And so that was a case where they tried something and it appears certainly so far to have made a real difference for that child. But it was, you know, really, really a tough position for the family and the physicians to be in as they tried to figure out what to do. It sounds like this kind of conversation is going to be happening a lot more too in the future. Yeah. And I think people are just a lot more aware of these complications because the chances of survival are so much better at least for some of the pediatric cancers. And so people, doctors and families are thinking ahead, maybe more than they used to be able to do. And on the one hand, you know, they're getting more information, which can be a great thing. But of course, it can also be agonizing as you try and figure out how to balance the different needs here to, you know, help this child as best you can. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. Jennifer Cousin Frankel is a staff writer for Science. You can find a link to her story and the related special section on pediatric cancer at sciencemag.org slash podcast. The section includes reviews on the genomic landscape of pediatric cancers, addressing the gap in treatment globally, and a look at the progress at targeted therapies for pediatric cancer. And that concludes this edition of the Science Podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, write to us at sciencepodcast at aaas.org. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, or you can listen on the science website. That's sciencemag.org slash podcasts. To place an ad on the podcast, contact midroll.com. The show was produced by Sarah Crespi and Megan Cantwell and edited by Podigy. Jeffrey Cook composed the music. On behalf of Science Magazine and its publisher, AAAS, thanks for joining us.